All right, so what I talked about earlier this morning is really was done just to create a foundation for this next presentation. And basically, it's what the title says. It's the, how do you develop a pediatric patient-specific dose protocol for any CT scanner or exam. Now, if you think about it for a minute, that's a pretty bold hypothesis that you can create a technique that works for any scanner, regardless of age, model, make, that works for pediatric patients for any diagnostic exam that you may choose to do. And the reason that's important is 80% of all pediatric CT scans in this country are not done in pediatric hospitals. They're done in adult hospitals that do pediatric patients occasionally. Sometimes when I'm more obnoxious, I say adult hospitals that do pediatric patients as a hobby, okay? Because let's face it, you're best at what you do most, okay? And so it's difficult to do a pediatric exam well in, adult, in an adult hospital when you don't do patients on a regular basis. So despite the fact that the adult hospitals do 80% of all children, children are still the vast minority of patients that the adult hospitals do. Um, Obviously, we should manage the dose and the image quality for pediatric exams. We obviously ought to do it also for uh, adult exams, but, you know, you're going to tend to get a pediatric bent from me because I've been working in pediatric hospitals now for 32 years. Both the X-ray tube voltage and the MAS should be altered for pediatric imaging, and a minimalist approach where you change only the MAS to reduce dose for kids is preferred over doing nothing. I'd rather see you also reduce the KVP, and we'll talk about how to do that, but you'll see that reducing both the KVP and the MAS is more involved, and a little more challenging. So our challenge is that, ideally, unique scan parameters should be established for each individual patient, accounting for their size, the type of CT examination, and the unique design characteristics of the CT scanner. So what does that mean? That means that if I'm going to do a CT chest, and I've got eight different CT scanners in my department, I need a detailed technique chart for each one of those eight CT scanners. For each exam I do, I need to have techniques for six different size patients. So all of a sudden, you're talking about a thousand different combinations of technique charts. Well, that can be done in academic centers. One of my colleagues, I always think of her when I give this lecture, she has about 40 fellows and postdocs at her command. And so if she wants to do something like this at her large teaching institution, she just marches all the postdocs and, and fellows and grabs them by the nap of the neck and say, you will do this. And they can get the job done. But what are the odds that this will happen in that adult institution that occasionally does a pediatric CT scan? And where do, the adult, where do these patients come from, by the way? Why, why are there pediatric patients at, at adult hospitals? Well, you can be in a remote area and there's just no pediatric hospital, you know, within reasonable geographic distance. But the other thing that tends to happen is, obviously, most adult hospitals get children every day in their emergency department. And if they come into the emergency department and they need a CT scan, obviously the adult hospital's gonna do it. So the chances of them doing that detailed analysis, I would say, are slim and none. I probably should have said none and slim, but at any rate, the technologist, what does the technologist in the adult department do when the kid comes? One of my, me one of my medical physics colleagues that's at a big teaching institution, she's very honest. She says when a kid comes into our department, 
all we medical physicists go run and hide, you know, because kids are difficult. Um, so how many of you in the room are former technologists? Okay, most of you, okay. Did you image children in an adult institution? Did you feel good about doing it? No, you, you wish you would have had more information, right? Okay. So the majority of uh, pediatric CT image does, does not occur in dedicated pediatric hospitals. So this is what we have. Okay, the, the full utilization of equipment design is only going to really happen if the operator thoroughly understands what they need to do. Okay, and BC here certainly doesn't understand what he needs to do with respect to bossy. Okay, so when I look around, when I go to an adult institution, this is what I see. Okay, so the image quality is not as good as it should be, and the doses aren't as reduced as they should be. Well, let's think about it for a minute. Who's responsible to provide good pediatric training? Who? Well, who provides adult training on equipment? The manufacturer. And I will say that the manufacturers do a reasonable job of providing technologists with information about buttonology for their given equipment on adult patients. But the manufacturers haven't trained their application specialists how to do that for pediatrics. Why? Because they don't understand it. Okay, so every time I see an application trainer come in to do applications in a pediatric hospital, they're sweating blood. You know, they can't wait for noon to come on Friday and they can, can get out of town, get out of Dodge, because they're very uncomfortable. They're just as uncomfortable as you were when you worked in an adult hospital as a technologist and you didn't have good information on how to deal with kids. So, we don't, the, the detailed technique charts are not a practical solution because the AAPM's been working on it for about four or five years and they've published some good definitive technique charts. One exam has been done so far for kids. It takes a lot of time. So, what are some of the other problems that we have to deal with with CT? Well, this is uh, some data from back in 1994 put together by Tony Seibert. Um, basically, this was CR, which is similar to CT in that you can screw up the radiographic technique and the image still looks fine, okay, because that's how the equipment's designed to operate. And here he's showing that uh, in the third and the fourth quarter that the S number on their uh, Fuji CR systems was, you know, right around 200 where it was supposed to be. And then he did the analysis a year later, and now he's got this peak out here and coined the term dose creep. Technologists are smart people. I don't need to tell you that because you're former technologists. Okay, what do you do? You quickly find out that if you increase the dose, you're not going to get as much pushback from the radiologist because the image quality will be better. And nobody likes to be yelled at or screamed at. Um, radiologists tend to be good at that when they're, you know, under stress. So here's a slide that originally I put together for CRDR but it really also applies to CT, and I call it the ugly. I went to, this is about 20 years ago, I went to a facility to learn about CR. This was in the days before DR. It was when we were first starting to transfer from screen film to, to digital, and this particular site ran national training programs for digital applications. And they said to me, oh, you're from a pediatric institution. You should go downstairs and talk to our pediatric technologists and see what they think of digital radiography. And this is what they told me. We love CR. We can use one, not two, not three, one. One 
radiographic technique, not for some, for all our pediatric patients. Well, obviously, that's not the right thing to do, okay? Because almost everybody in that case is getting the wrong dose. But yet, that was the institution that was providing nat national training. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to establish a department's reference level. Now, you notice I didn't say DRL. DRL. I didn't say diagnostic reference level. Why? DRLs, by definition, must involve multiple sites. Okay, we're not interested in multiple sites here. We're just interested in what do I need to do to establish that things are being done right in my institution, okay? So we're going to call it an RL, and what I do is I, if I can establish an RL based on SSDE in the department for chess, for different size patients, then I can compare the SSDE after the projection scan, but before I do the acquisition, and if the SSDE that the scan, or the CTDI vol that the scanner tells me I'm going to get based on the projection scan is greater than my target, I have an opportunity to adjust the radiographic technique before I do the acquisition. So essentially, we're doing each patient based upon standard RLs in the department based on SSDE, which again does what? Takes into account the change in size of the patient and the change in the radiographic technique. So if I have RLs based on SSDE, and I can figure out the SSDE before I actually do the acquisition during the exam, I can use this simple approach to manage each patient dose regardless of the exam, and regardless of what scanner I'm doing it on. Now that still sounds preposterous, probably, so we'll, we'll get there in a minute. So again, I adjust the clinical technique to match the RL, and then, of course, I've got to know how to do that, whether I'm in the manual mode or in the AEC mode. We'll talk a little bit more about AEC at, at the end of the lecture. And just as a qualifier here, I'm going to go through this whole process so you can see the steps that are involved, but I'm not advocating that this is something that radiologists and technologists should do on their own. This is something that, again, should be done by that triumphant, the radiologists and the technologists in cons consultation with their qualified medical physicists, because this is pretty easy to get confused and tangled up in and making mistakes that result in things that are really not desired. So where do we start? Well, we start with the adult patient. It's, where are we? We're in an adult hospital, right? This is for the adult hospitals. Well, what should the adult hospitals know how to do? They ought to know how to do adult heads and adult chests and adult abdomens. They ought to know how to do that. Okay, and so what do they do with their techniques for, for adults? They give them to the qualified medical physicist when he, comes, he or she comes in annually to do the CTDI measurements, right? Because that's what the AACR says we have to do. So why do I want to start with that? The reason I want to start with it is because Every department's radiologist has a unique tolerance for noise in the image. Some departments read rather noisy images. Some departments read rather quiet images. If you start with the, with the department's techniques for adults, for heads and bodies, you are starting at the level of noise that the radiologists are comfortable with in that institution. Now, the other thing that's important about this process is that you've got data in the CTDI vol measurements to tell you how the scanners differ from one another with respect to dose. 
And so we've accounted for both the uniqueness of the radiologists in that department and the uniqueness of the, each of the scanners in the department by starting with the adult. So we established reduced doses of RL for pediatric cases after we've established what's going on with adults. All right, so let's, let's dig into this a little bit. You pick a scanner. It's going to be the primary scanner in the department. Okay, and the first thing you do is you use, as I said, you use the measured data of the radiation production of each of your site's CT scanners. Again, your QMP measured the CTDI vol using the techniques of the institution for both head and body. And so you have the associated techniques and you've got the CTDI vol measurements. This really is a radical concept. We're now going to use that data that the qualified medical physicist comes in and measures every year to have an impact on patient care. That's pretty radical. Because prior to now, what did you do with that data? You put it in the file, OK? And you dragged it out every time an inspector came. So we're going to do something rash, and we're going to actually use it to improve patient care. OK. Now, so the first thing you do, though, is now we've, we've got the dose that the, that the site wants to use for adults, but the first question we've got to ask, is it a reasonable dose? Just because they like it doesn't mean that it's correct. Well, how do we do that? Well, the ACR accreditation program has submitted national DRLs, and they say that routine heads CTDI vol 16 shall be less than 75 milligray, and that routine bodies for adults should be less than 25 milligray. So all you have to do is look at the results of the physicists that came in and did their measurements, and are they less than 75 milligray and 25 milligray respectively? And if they are, those techniques for adult patients are reasonable. So again, we're on the primary scanner, and we may decide that we may look at the body and it may be 34 milligram. We may say, well, you know, that's, that's kind of high. Um, what can I do to maybe adjust that? Okay, so I can obviously change the KV, the tube current, the rotation time, the pitch, and I can calculate the SSDE. And as a result of that, I'll come up with an RL for scanner number one. So let's look at an example. The physicists came in on scanner number one. They used 120 kV and 250 mass and a pitch of one because they're doing axial scanning. And they measured a CTDI vol of 25. You pull that all out of the files. Okay? Now that you have that, you decide, well, let's reduce it. 20%. Well, how do I reduce it 20%? Well, if I reduce the MAS from 250 to 200 mass, I'll reduce the CTDI vol by 20%. And it will go from 25 milligray down to 20 milligray. Well, instead of changing the mass, I could change the pitch. I could leave the mass at 250 and change the pitch to 1.2. Either one of those has the same effect on the dose. And I know that my CTDI vol is 20 milligray, and I look up in the tables in, the, in TG204, and I see that the conversion factor is 1.14, and that gives me 23 milligray SSDE for my adult abdomen, for scanner number one. What is that? That's scanner's number one RL level for an adult. Then what I do is I apply the information to the other scanners in the department. What's my goal? My goal is to provide the same image quality regardless of what scanner is used in the department. That's the goal, isn't it? You know, the radiologist shouldn't sit, sit there and say, oh, this is a lousy image. It must have come from scanner number three. You know, they, they shouldn't have to do that. Well, how do we make sure the image quality is the same? Well, 
The starting place is simply to match the patient's radiation dose on all of the site scanners. Now, qualification. If I do that, similar image quality is not guaranteed, but it's likely. But what I want to say as a qualifi qualifying factor here is any time you adjust patient doses in CT, you have to carefully go back and look at the impact on the image quality and make sure you didn't overdo it or you didn't do something opposite of what you thought you were doing. So again, this is an opportunity for that triumvirate of the radiologist and the technologist and the QMP to consult about the results and whether or not they're reasonable. Okay? So, I want the same adult RL for each scanner. And that means I want the SSDs to be equal. But notice, while my SSDEs are equal, more than likely my CTI, CTDI vols will not be equal. Well, they'll be equal. My CTDI vols will also be equal, but what may not be equal? The MAS, okay? Because the MAS determines how much radiation output the scanner makes. Now, why are scanners different in their output? Some scanners have longer distances from the focal spot to the detector. Inverse square law. That's going to affect how much radiation the, the scanner's got to generate to get the right radiation level to the detector. The bow tie filter. Each manufacturer treats the bow tie filter data for their scanner as if it's the golden jewels of the king of tut. You know, it's their proprietary advantage over everybody else. But all the bow tie filters are different. And what does a filter do? It attenuate, attenuates radiation in the beam. So if a particular manufacturer is using a heavy bow tie filter, they have to generate that. You have to have more technique. So you need more mass. So this is my point of my second lecture, if you don't remember anything else. Mass alone cannot be used to compare patient dose between two CT scanners. For years, I had two different CT scanners in the department, and one required double the mass of the other one. And some of my radiologists didn't want to use that scanner because they insisted that meant the dose had to be twice as high on that scanner, which wasn't true. And SSDE tells us that. So anyway, we've got an RL for scanner number one. How do we develop an RL for scanner number two? Well, the medical physicist came in, and he's a creature of habit, like Tom and Melissa and I. And, you know, he, he measured 250 mass on the first scanner, so he's going to use 250 mass on the second scanner, which is okay, pitch of one. But instead of getting 20 milligray, we only get 13 milligray CTDI vol. That's okay. That scanner's design characteristics are different from scanner number one. So now for me to get to 20 milligray, which is where I want to be, I have to increase the mass from 250 mass to 385. Okay? So notice, scanner number one is not using the same mass as scanner number two. All right? But that's okay. What did we just do? we matched the SSDE between scanner number one and scanner number two for the adult patient. And we keep doing this until we get all the scanners done. And because I have 20 milligray CTDI vol on this scanner too, I'm also going to have 23 milligray SSDE RL for scanner number two, just like I did for scanner number one. So I keep doing that for my eight scanners, and when I'm all done, I've got eight scanners all operating at a different MAS, all delivering the same SSDE for an adult abdomen of 23 milligray. Okay? Now, that's something an adult institution should do regardless of whether they ever do any children. We've, all we've done is matched up the unique characteristics of the different scanners in the department. So that's step number one. Okay. So um, again, we look at all those scanners and make sure that 
things are reasonable with respect to national standards. And now what we want to do is we want to change those techniques for pediatric patients. Well, how do we do that? Where do we get that data? Well, one source of that data is Image Gently. If you go to the Image Gently website, you'll find these types of tables. These types of tables on the Image Gently website are Excel sheets that are active. You can actually take them and download them and use them to establish techniques in a given department. So let's look a little more closely at everything that's in this table. First of all, you see AP and lateral thickness as a function of patient size in the first two columns. Those aren't guesses. That's published data from the reference that's here that relates to an average age. Now, remember we said age wasn't a good predictor of size, but we can establish an average size for a given age or an average age for a given size. We can do that, and that's what I did here in these two columns. The next column over is the effective diameter. We talked about effective diameter earlier this morning. The way you calculate the effective diameter is you take the product of the AP dimension and the lateral dimension, multiply them together, and then you take the square root. And you get the effective diameter of that circle that has the same circle of water that has the same area as the area of the actual anatomy. And then in this column, you have the mass. And this came from National Cancer for Health Statistics publication. So what I'm trying to do with this table is I'm trying to give people whatever they want to, are most comfortable with. I'd like to see them work with the lateral dimension of the patient. But if the department wants to work based upon weight, they can. If they want to work on the basis of age, they can. The data's all here. So, you know, this just tells us that that newborn patient is 10 centimeters in the AP direction, 14 in the lateral. Effective diameter is 11.6 centimeters, and that Little newborn is four kilograms in weight. All right, now that we've gone through that, what comes next? Well, the first thing we could do is we could bury our head in the sand and not adjust our techniques for kids. And that's essentially what everybody did prior to 2001. And as a result of that, what was my newborn dose for the abdomen relative to the adults in a given department? It was 2.6 times higher. Remember, we did that little experiment, and we saw that there was 2.6 times difference in dose between the 10 centimeter phantom and the 32 centimeter phantom? Well, if I use adult techniques, my pediatric doses are two and a, and a half times greater for newborn abdomens than adult doses in the same institution. So obviously, we don't want to do that. Now, this column, which says limited MAS reduction, was what Image Gently published in 2008. And it basically said, all right, we're going to keep the newborn dose, we're going to keep all the doses equal. We're going to make sure no pediatric dose exceeds the adult dose in a department. And in 2008, we didn't know near as much as we know today, and we thought that was a reasonable place to start. And it was a reasonable place to start. And that's what was on the Image Gently website in 2008. Well, as I said, we've learned a lot since then. There's been some more publications. The Quirk, which was a consortium of six children's hospitals, got together and looked at abdominal CT scans before there was a national dose registry at the ACR. And basically, this column is, I call the aggressive MAS reduction factor. These are the reduction factors that you can use in a pediatric department. And how do I know that? Well, as part of that research project, we actually evaluated image quality. 
in addition to reducing the doses. And we established that in the six hospitals, six pediatric hospitals, that the pediatric radiologists were comfortable reading newborn abdomens that used an MAS that was one quarter of the adult MAS in the institution. Now you notice that the original limited reduction was only a factor of two. So we went from a factor of two to a factor of four. It's more aggressive, but pediatric radiologists that read pediatric images every day are comfortable looking at images at this quality. Then in between here, I've got something that's simply the average of the limited MAS and the aggressive MAS reduction. Why did I do that? You're really only best at what you do a lot of. And so most adult radiologists are not as comfortable reading pediatric images as pediatric radiologists are because they don't have as much experience doing it, they don't have as much confidence. And most adult radiologists are not comfortable reading pediatric images at the same dose level that pediatric radiologists are comfortable with. So I would say that most adult institutions would want to start with the moderate mass reduction factor. And if the radiologists are comfortable with that, you can move to the more aggressive one. But I think most adult institutions, if you went from the limited model to the aggressive model overnight, that the results would be rejected. Now, as I said, we evaluated image quality, and then what we did was we created a parameter called SSDE divided by SSDE adult. It's a ratio, and that's what's plotted in this chart on the ordinate. That ratio is plotted, and obviously it's a straight line, and it's, a, it's fitted to the data, and so we have a linear regression equation here that I can calculate the ratio of SSDE over the SSDE adult. Well, why do I want to do that? Well, what's just SSDE? The SSD, SSDE is the SSDE that I want to use as a function of patient size. If the patient changes size, I want to change the SSDE. The SSDE adult is fixed in a given department. Remember, we set up RLs for each one of the scanners based upon what the radiologist liked in the department. That's SSDE adult, so we know that. So what, do I, so what do I do with this ratio? I take the ratio and I multiply it by SSDE adult for the given scanner, and what do I know? I, I know the SSDE for my pediatric patient. Because you look at the example here, um, we picked a, a child that's got a lateral dimension of 14 centimeters, and I come down here and I go across and I plot that, and it tells me that I want to reduce my MAS by a factor of two, which is exactly what you saw in the tables. And as I've already said, the newborn dose is half of the adult dose. But the mass is a quarter, because to keep the doses the same, I had to reduce the mass by a factor of two. Okay, so I've established an RL for pediatric patients on that scanner. And for every patient size that comes in, all I have to do is plug it into that linear equation, and I get the SSDE RL for a unique size patient. Now that's assuming I use the original high voltage and that doesn't change, I'm at 120 kV and all I'm doing is reducing the mass. And so I multiply the mass for the adult times SSDE reference over SSDE adult, which again is this plot. And that gives me a reasonable dose with less image quality, which may or may not be acceptable to the radiologist in that department, depending on whether you grab the moderate or the aggressive model. Now this plot is for the aggressive model. It's not for the moderate model. All right, so 
We're still working on our pediatric RLs, and you see here what we have is, this is the limited approach. And notice, what's on the right? What's on the right is the SSDE. Well, how did I design the limited approach? I designed the limited approach to do what? Keep the SSDE constant for all size patients. Hey, man, it worked. Okay, all the, all the SSDEs are constant at 23 milligram. And that's what I designed, the, designed this whole thing to do. All right, so then I go to the aggressive mode and, well, it works again. 11 is half of 23. And again, this is an active table. So all I had to do was fill in the colored boxes with the scan parameters for the adult patient, which go in down here. And then the table does all the work to come up with the resulting SSDEs. But you need more than that. And there's, that's for the moderate. But you need more than that. This is where we just left off. This is the SSDEs. The last three columns give you the actual MAS that you should use for, to get those SSDEs. And so this is for scanner number one. Remember scanner number one? We picked 200 mass, right? What did we pick for scanner number two? 385. Bam, there it is. In the box, in the colored box for the adult, it's got 200 instead of 385. And the table calculates all the values as a function of the reductions. So, you know, obviously all the MASs now are different for scanner number two compared to scanner number one, as they should be. Okay, and you can, you can do this for all eight scanners in your department if you have that many. Okay, question. Newborn dose equals the adult dose if the adult MAS is unchanged. Newborn dose equals half of the adult dose if the adult mass is cut in half. Newborn dose equals the adult dose if the adult mass is divided by three, if it's divided by four. Or newborn dose equals half of adult dose not provided Oh, I'm sorry, newborn dose equal half of adult dose does not provide clinically useful images. So which, of this, which one of these is true? This one's a little tougher. Number four is true, okay? We have to divide the MAS by a factor of four for the aggressive model to get the appropriate technique for kids. Three works probably for what? If two works for the moderate model and four works for the aggressive model, three is probably a pretty good number for the intermediate model, okay? All right, now, that's abdomen, okay? We've established an RL for all eight of our scanners for abdomens. Well, what do we do for chess? We'd expect the technique needed for chest to be different because of the air in the thorax. So again, we go back to scanner number one. We use 200 mass and we got 20 milligray, which is 23 milligray SSDE. Well, what's, what intuitively would you think we want to do? Do we want to increase the mass or reduce it? We probably want to reduce it because the chest should be less attenuating than the, than the abdomen. So we made the decision that we're gonna do our chest at 20% less than our abdomens. So instead of using 200 mass, we use 160 mass. And instead of getting 20 milligray CTDI vol, we get 16 milligray CTDI vol. And that gives us an SSDE of 18 milligray. Well, voila. What is that? That's our RL for chests on scanner number one. And we can do that for all the other scanners to come up with the unique RL. And then what do we do? Again, we plug those RLs into the colored boxes on the table, and it gives us all our MASs for chests for our eight scanners. Now, 
when you do chess, you got to be a little careful. The data for chess hasn't been published yet by Quirk. I know the results, and I'll cheat a little bit and don't tell radiology where we submitted the paper, but basically the results are not that much different, as you might guess. So, yeah, you can use the aggressive, if you can use the aggressive model for abdomens, you can use the aggressive model for chess. But when I originally made this slide some time ago, I said, be careful, we really don't know yet because we haven't processed the data. Uh, you might want to start with the moderate level, okay? But the aggressive model should be fine for chess also. All right, so we've taken care of chest, abdomens, and pelvises. So we've, we've taken care of the body. Well, what do we do with the head? Well, and again, we're doing all this without iterative reconstruction, by the way. We'll get there in a minute, okay? So we have validated DRLs from ACR. It says that, that my adult head should be less than 75 milligray. And it also says that um, my one-year-old head should be less than 35 milligray. So, when I originally developed the simple table for heads on the Image Gently website, I did the same thing that I did for the body. I adjusted the mass so that no head dose for kids was ever greater than the adult dose. Well, obviously, that's not the appropriate thing to do anymore because the ACR, based upon data that they've gotten from sites, says that, well, if 75 milligray is okay for an adult head, you should only use 35 milligray, not 75 milligray, for the one-year-old head. So I had to come up with a new model, okay? Uh, let's see, let's get through this, okay? And what do I do with the, what do I do with the, hmm, what happened to it? Did it disappear? Huh. Yeah, it disappeared. But anyway, what I do is I take that, those new MAS values for the head, and I dump them into the head table in, the, in Image Gently. There's a table for heads, and there's a table for abdomens and thoraxes. Once the thorax data gets published, the thorax data will be split out from the adult body data and pediatric data, and there'll be three tables in Image Gently. All right, so what do we do for iterative reconstruction? Most sites today are using iterative reconstruction. Everything we've talked about up until now has assumed that no iterative reconstruction was being done. Well, how do we take all this and make it apply to iterative reconstruction? Well, what most sites do when they get iterative, re iterative reconstruction, they say, well, you know, we probably better be careful with this and not overdo it. So they pick a, a moderate level of iterative reconstruction and do some trial by error, and they finally settle on a clinical level that they're going to use. And all we need to do as a result of that is calculate what the CTDI vol would be at their iterative reconstructive techniques instead of the standard techniques. And then what do we do with that data? We plug it into the colored boxes in the tables. And now you've got technique charts for iterative reconstruction. So the tables in the Image Gently website are pretty powerful. Now, everything I've talked about up until now assumes what? No change in KV. All we're doing, all we've done so far is adjust the MAS. And clearly, we should use lower KVs for kids. Uh, we should reduce the high voltage, and there's a couple cases. We can reduce the high voltage and keep the dose to the patient the same. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, you take the MAS at 120 kV that the table gave you, let's assume it's 100 mass, 
and you plug 100 mass into your scanner after you do the projection scan, and the scanner will tell you what the CTDI vol is for that technique. Then you take the scanner and you reduce the KV to your desired KV, and what will happen to the CTDI vol? It'll change, okay, and it'll go down. And so I've got to turn the MAS up until the CTDI vol at the new KV equals the CTDI vol at 120 KV. So what did I do? I turned the KV down and I turned the MAS up. But I did it in such a way that the dose to the patient is unchanged. What will happen to the image quality in this case? I'll get increased contrast at the same dose because I'm using a lower KV, and I expect to see more subject contrast as a result of that. Now, what will happen to perceived noise in the image? The perceived noise in the image will go up, even though the dose is the same, because it's a higher contrast image. And it's easier to see the noise, and so uh, more noise will be perceived in the image, despite the fact that the absolute noise is unchanged. All right, so we set the size dependent mass at 120. We note the displayed CTI vol. We reduce the voltage to the desired value on the scanner, and we increase the mass, and we put it into the magical tables, and we have increased perceived noise at the same dose. Well, why is this not advancing? Oh, okay. So let's take this case. I got a 10-year-old patient. And I want to use a reduced KV, but instead of keeping the dose the same, I want to not change the image quality. In the first case, I got improved image quality and my dose didn't improve. In this second case, I'm going to keep the image quality the same as 120, but I'm going to get some dose savings. And so what I do is, I set the size department MAS at 120 kV. I note the displayed CTDI vol on the scanner. And I measure the increased contrast at that lower kV compared to 120 kV. And bear with me, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Well, that minute was short. So this is, this is the second section of the ACR phantom. And Tom talked about this. You can, you can do an ROI analysis, or you can actually look uh, visually to determine low contrast resolution. But you can actually use this to calculate a contrast to noise ratio, as Tom had pointed out. Uh, you simply put an ROI over the one centimeter mass, and then you put another ROI right beside it, and you do the math. And you can come up with a contrast to noise ratio for 120 kV. Then you do the same thing for 80 kV, if that's your new kV. Now, again, when you do this, you've got to make sure you're using the clinical field of view bow tie filter that the scanner is going to use. You've got to simulate the clinical situation as much as possible. Now, what happened when I reduced the kV to the noise? Well, the noise is going to increase, if that's all I do. If I just reduce the KV, don't change the mass, the scanner's producing less radiation, it's at a lower energy, more will be attenuated in the patient's body, and less will be getting to the detector, and the image is going to get noisier. Okay? Well, what's contrast to noise ratio? It's contrast over noise. So if my noise is going up, my contrast to noise ratio is going down. My image quality is going down if all I do is lower the KV and keep the mass the same. So let's just assume I did my measurements, and my contrast went up 40%, because we expect contrast to go up as I go to a lower KV, right? So the contrast went up 40%. 
My noise went up 60%. Did my contrast to noise ratio change? Yes, and what did it do? It went down. I want to keep it constant because I want the image quality to be the same. So what do I do? I increase the mass so that the noise only goes up 40%. That's my new mass at my lowered KV. And my CNR at 120 KV will equal my CNR at 80 KV, roughly. And so I should have the same image quality, but at a reduced patient dose. All right. Just some additional considerations. How much can the high voltage be lowered? Well, that depends on the diagnostic task and the patient size. Scanners today give you various choices of KV between uh, 140 and 70. And actually, I think, if I recall correctly, there was a scanner out there at the RSNA this past year that went down to 60 KV. I think, but maybe I'm dreaming. I don't know. But anyway, they keep going to lower and lower KVs. So how does that affect contrast? How does it affect noise? How does it affect artifacts? How does it affect the scanning speed of the scanners? Well, contrast, of course, is going to be improved as KV goes down. And as I've said before, I'm going to have higher noise levels because higher contrast amplifies the noise so it can be seen more easily. And we say the perceived noise goes up versus the absolute noise. So typically, the mass must be increased any time you reduce the KV. What happens to the scanning speed? Well, it's going to suffer because the CT scanner is only capable of putting out so much radiation. And once you get to the maximum tube current at the selected KV, to get more photons, you either have to reduce the pitch of the table, increase the scan rotation time, or whatever. So um, you can play with the pitch or the rotation time. Uh, and as you do that, as the scan gets longer and longer, because that's the only way to get more photons once you're at the maximum, you're going to increase scan time and motion on sharpness. So you can overdo a good thing, like most situations. What about beam hardening? Well, beam hardening is going to affect the artifacts in the image. If you were to see a CT scan result without all the corrections that the manufacturers make to cover up the sins of CT scanning, nobody would look at the images. And if you think about it, the manufacturers have had a lot more years to figure out how to cover up the sins of 120 kV than they've had to cover up the sins of 60 kV or 80 kV, because what they all know. They all know, knew prior to maybe five, seven years ago, nobody was using lower KVs much. And if nobody's using it, they're not getting any experience with artifacts that the human body generates. So I expect more artifacts at lower KVs, especially streak artifacts. Uh, and it's, it's also more problematic for high contrast objects and dense materials, which obviously are going to be high contrast objects. Well, another thing that complicates all this is that the contrast to noise ratio needed for infants and small children is different than what is needed for adults. And that's because little kids have less fat between their organs. And as a result of that, there's not as much natural subject contrast at the interface. Little kid images tend to be displayed at thinner slices because they're smaller. And as a result of that, we tend to get higher noise levels that are tolerated for adult images. If you think about it, the next time you're around a newborn, your fist, for instance, is roughly the size of your heart. Next time you're around the newborn, look at the size of their fist. It gives you a concept of how much smaller the structures are in infant compared to an adult body. You need better image quality to see what you need to see. 
So my scan pro progression is set up the voltage in the MAS as previously determined in the department. That's the, the brute force method when you got an army of fellows and, and, and to help you do that. You can do that or the, you can calculate the SSD and compare calculated SSDEs after the projection scan to reference SSDEs and adjust the MAS or KV as necessary. That's something that I would advocate the adult hospital should and can do for the pediatric patients that they're going to see. Now, pediatrics is an interesting field because children are not just small adults. And I love this paper that I'm showing here. It says, dose reduction in pediatric CT, a rational approach. And this was published in um, 2003, Dose Reduction Principle. It was published by four medical physicists and a radiologist, and I have the utmost respect for, I'm sorry, three medical physicists. I have the utmost respect for three of the medical physicists, or two of the three, because they're past presidents of the AAPM. They really thought this was true in 2003, okay? They thought that you could use exactly the same contrast to noise ratio for any patient of any size. That's what this whole paper is based on. The rational approach is keep the CNR constant. Well, as a result of this, they identified that you could reduce the MAS 35 times for a 12 centimeter effective diameter versus 28. And if you do the physics and the CNR, they're absolutely correct. But I can guarantee you if you do this, your radiologist will revolt because you need a contrast to noise ratio for little kids that are about three times greater than adults. But being good adult medical physicists, they didn't realize that. All right, now, are we done? No, you don't get to go to lunch yet. Okay, we've established RLs. Our goal is to modify our scanning techniques so that the, R, the dose delivered to the patient in SSDE is equal to or less than the defined RL. Now, if you're doing manual techniques, that's easy. You simply adjust the mass and it goes linearly. Nobody uses manual techniques much anymore. We all use automatic exposure control. And unfortunately, all the manufacturers don't choose to do that the same way. Now, one manufacturer uses what's called a reference mass. And at less than 80, uh, for a specified age, they recommend you set 80 mass for the reference mass and for Anybody that's bigger than that, you set 200 mass. And then all of this, it's not logical, but you know what? It works. So kudos to this manufacturer. They, they figured it out, and, and basically it works for kids. Now, you go to manufacturer B, and what they do is they require you to set a noise index. And so what did they assume when they designed this? They made the same mistake as the three physicists and the radiologists made in, in 2003. They thought the same CNR, if it's good for an adult, it's good for a kid. And so they really thought that all you had to do to use their automatic exposure control system was to find the noise index that worked. Because if I increase the noise in the image, my contrast to noise ratio will go down. If I decrease it, it'll go up. It's really very simple. And I can do that by changing the noise index. Because the noise index is proportional to the standard deviation of the noise, and I just set a minimum and maximum MAS and a scan time and the noise index. And again, the assumption is I'm going to use a constant noise index, and I'm going to get a constant CNR, and I am. But as I've said, it fails because a constant CNR doesn't work for kids. Now, obviously, CT scanners today are very complex. And again, I go back to the same statement, the triumvirate is important. Once you know what your RLs are, 
that you want to get to, you got to figure out how to change the noise index to get those RLs. And the only way you're going to do that is if the radiologist, the technologist, qualified medical physicist, and maybe those three will still need some help from the manufacturer. Okay? So you still have the challenge of figuring out how to set up the automatic exposure control to handle all this. So in conclusion, due to the variations in patient size, type of CT examinations, and design of the actual CT scanner, patient CT dose should be estimated and managed during examination. And that's regardless of the patient size. I've talked about pediatrics. What about the bariatric patients? What about the bariatric patients? What do you always see when you see the images of a bariatric patient? What does the image look like? It's a gray, noisy mass of nothing. Okay? It's a tough imaging situation, and the image is always much noisier than a standard adult image in that department. Now, why? Why is the image always noisier for the bariatric patient? Because the site didn't use SSDE to set up their bariatric patient techniques, because what do they think about? They think about the fact that if I double my MAS, I'm going to double the dose to my patient. That's not true. Because as you get into the bari bariatric patient, the SSDE conversion factors become less than one. So SSDE actually becomes smaller than the CTDI vol for the large patients. So today, people tend to say, well, gee, I use 200 mass for a standard adult. I can't go over 350 mass for a bariatric patient. Their doses will be unwieldy. Not necessarily true, because the SSDE is the indicated patient dose. And that's not rising as fast as the MAS is, because the SSD conversion factors are going down as the patient gets bigger. So SSDE is just import, as important for adults as it is for kids and should be applied in all adult hospitals for their adults. Marilyn Gosky, who used to be the chairperson of Image Gently, used to like to say, well, you know, I've got two kids, a boy and a girl. My son is six foot three and weighs 220 pounds. And my daughter is five foot two and wears a size zero dress. And she said, their abdomen thicknesses are not the same. Okay? And they're both adults. Okay? So there's small adults, there's medium adults, there's large adults, and there's bariatric adults. And really, the adult institutions should be addressing that. So reducing the mass alone reduces patient dose and image quality, because the noise increases. Reducing the KV alone reduces patient dose, and the perceived noise will go up because I've got a contrast to your image, because my contrast increases. If I reduce the KV and increase the mass, I can do that in such a way that I maintain the image quality and reduce the dose, which is the preferred way of doing things, or I can maintain the dose and improve the image quality. Uh, both contrast and perceived noise are going to increase in the last example. So moderate reductions in patient dose with loss of image quality, mass reduction only, is preferred over doing nothing because messing with the KV is more complicated and time consuming. So ideally you should change both the KV and the MAS for little kids. But as you saw, that's much more complicated than just reducing the mass, and it's much better to just reduce the mass as opposed to doing nothing. Thank you.